Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Maxwell Institute's Book of Mormon Studies podcast. My guest today is my colleague here at the Maxwell Institute, Christian Heal. His office is just right down the hallway, but we're still recording this remotely. Christian is a senior research fellow here at the Maxwell Institute. Uh, his research focuses on how early Christians read the scriptures. And for longtime listeners of the podcast, you will recognize his sonorous voice. Very pleasing indeed. Um, he was a frequent guest on the podcast several years ago. We're delighted to have him back. Christian, welcome. Thanks so much, Rosalind. It's great to be here. Today we are going to be addressing some of the scholarship on the book of Jacob. I was talking to my research assistant uh, the other day and I was telling her a little bit about the podcast and telling her that we were doing an episode on every book in the Book of Mormon that tried to hit some of the notable pieces of scholarship written about that book and her eyes got big and she said, I had no idea there was that much scholarship about the Book of Mormon out there. And I think that her reaction is probably similar to many of our listeners. Is there really that much scholarship on the Book of Mormon out there? And the answer is yes. There's actually a lot of really excellent scholarship on the Book of Mormon out there. It seems like it's growing every month um, to the point now, actually, where it can be hard to keep up with it all. Uh, but there, there are riches to be found, and we're going to share with you today uh, four pieces that we have found to be very insightful and helpful. But Christian, speaking to my research assistant, Sophia, and to other listeners out there who are intrigued by this idea of scholarship about the Book of Mormon, but maybe aren't super familiar with it, uh, how would you suggest that they go about getting themselves oriented, getting their bearings about the Book of Jacob? Um, yeah, it's not, uh, it's not that easy to do. I initially looked in our um, Book of Mormon Studies sort of introduction that I'm um, edited by four great Book of Mormon scholars here on the and the campus, but they don't provide a sort of a book by book introduction. They don't give you that gateway into um, the studying an individual book, but instead focus on the whole field of Book of Mormon studies, which is itself kind of, um, you know, burgeoning, as you say. I mean, we really do have a, a really lively um, discipline, a lively kind of field of study, which is very exciting. What I tend to do um, when I'm looking at a new book of scripture and that I haven't really spent time with or I've only spent time with kind of superficially is I want to get some kind of orientation. I want to first give myself a chance to, to sort of see the 10,000 foot view and to get to start getting a sense of kind of what the, the issues are in it. And often, I mean, this is where encyclopedias and uh, dictionaries become sort of useful tools, useful entry points. And we have a couple of good ones for um, the, the Book of Mormon. Um, we have the Encyclopedia of Mormonism, which people might not think of as a sort of a place to go. This is a great resource that was done in the 90s and is still sort of useful and interesting and valuable today. Um, it's available at EOM, Encyclopedia of Mormonism, .byu .edu, um, as on in an online form. And John Tanner did a, a lovely a sort of introduction to the book of uh, Jacob um, it, there. And then Dennis Largy's kind of Book of Mormon Reference Companion is another kind of useful uh, overview of, of kind of things on the Book of Mormon that give themselves, yeah, there we go. This is a hefty book. Um, it would be nice to have it in an online format. Um, but it is, um, and in its for its, it really kind of broke new ground in gathering to up the kind of best thinking and best scholarship on the Book of Mormon when it was published. And and again, John John Tanner and I think Richard Craycroft kind of write on the figure of Jacob and the and the kind of Book of Jacob there and give a really meaningful kind of entry point. So now you have a sense of kind of what's going on. You can start focusing in and. I think the next step was always just to read through the text carefully. And there that you have a sort of a, a choice of companions as you read through the text. I really like a good sort of study Bible when I'm reading uh, through a biblical text um, in translation. And so that you've got those orienting um, features um, to it. And so 
we're fortunate now with the publication of, of Grant Hardy's The Annotated Book of Mormon to have a really great study book of Mormon. And uh, I um, that's what I used to prepare for um, kind of reading Jacob, just reading through carefully um, every verse, every footnote, just to see kind of what um, what the interesting questions are and what's going on in the book. And Hardy it gives so there are there are a number of different texts you can use. And if you look at kind of scholars, like uh, proper Book of Mormon scholars, they'll always have in the first footnote, I'm using Royal Skousen's critical text, mm -hmm. the Book of Mormon. And that's a, a volume which stands at the end of a very long sort of tradition of a very long project of evaluating all the textual variants and or and the kind of questions of textual difference in the Book of Mormon and presents us with a, a kind of a clean text. Um, but there's very little annotation. And so Grant Hardy did, a, he, he did, this is the third sort of um, in a, a the third reader's edition that he's provided. And this one by far and away is the most rich. And so he formats the text, he introduces headings. You've got kind of useful theological notes and references to Webster's dictionary when there are obscure words that don't necessarily kind of appear in today's vocabulary or perhaps have a different meaning. He gives you all the kind of intertext so you can see, you know, where the, where the book of Mormon is engaging with the old and new Testament. And he really identifies this kind of literary and theological world of, of Joseph Smith in those cases where the language in the Book of Mormon reflects a kind of a 19th century um, context rather than the kind of biblical context. And so it's a really wonderful, I mean, I can't uh, kind of recommend it enough. And the, once I've done, once you've kind of, you've had that high level overview and you've gone through the, the text carefully, then I think it's time to kind of dive into the bibliography um, there is uh, Farms published uh, back in the 90s, again, 1996, a, an annotated bibliography, which I think had six, more than 6,000 entries in it. Mm. And then the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies has been publishing for a few years these kind of annual bibliographies of the Book of Mormon, just so you can sort of see this um, uh, growing number of, of uh, books and articles that are published on it. And so there is a bit of a gap between the about a 20 year gap where um, we don't yet have a, a thorough bibliography. And this is something which I'm hoping will, you know, be addressed. Magically by, appear? Yeah. Can we get the a, elves to um, make that I mean, us? Yeah, I really, that would be. I'll, I'll just leave those books outside my door and say, <laughs> like, could you deliver me a website tomorrow? That would be, that would be very nice. Um, and then I'll look at, I'll look for sort of major contributions. Um, sort of book length studies and use those to triangulate sort of down and, and assess and, and recent book length studies, which will often those authors have sort of done the work of assessing the pre existing bibliography, what one would, one would sort of hope. And generally that is the case. And so we have four books on the book of Jacob, and that's actually quite a lot, um, for, uh, for a quite, quite a short biblical book I and mean, quite a short book of Mormon book. Um, and I think one of them is a single authored one, which we'll talk a bit about um, today, Deidre Green's 2020 Jacob, A Brief Theological Introduction. And then we have these two wonderful essay collections, the sort of monumental, um, the allegory of the olive tree, the olive, the Bible and Jacob five, um, edited by Stephen Bricks and, and John Welsh, Jack Welsh, who uh, this is a, a really a product of the kind of golden age of farms when there was so much great research being done on the Book of Mormon that produced these kind of great sort of wonderful tomes, right? I mean, this book, the book on, on um, King Benjamin's address, King Benjamin's address mm -hmm. Warfare in the Book of Mormon, and so sort of you've got this lovely uh, series of, of uh, conferences and kind of gatherings, which are really kind of lively. It must have been a very, well, uh, I mean, I'm old enough to remember, I suppose, seeing it kind of, you know, from afar. Um, uh, this kind of great work that's being done and reading about it in kind of insights. And then uh, more recently, Adam Miller and Joe Spencer's Christ and Antichrist reading Jacob seven, which is from the second annual um, Latter-day Saint theology seminar held in 2015. Were you at that one, Rosalind? I was not at that one. No. You weren't, you weren't. I don't even have the volume on my shelf at the moment. Tragically, I can't oh. show and tell. Oh, okay. Well, 
it's this one. There we go, the red yeah. one. So it is a it's a lovely collection of um, um, of kind of thoughtful essays that moves into that kind of new um, uh, school of of reading uh, scripture. And then most recently, this splendid book has just appeared, um, sort of this year, the beginning of this year, from the Religious um, Education's Book of Mormon Academy, and it's a lo lovely collection on uh, Jacob, Jacob Faith and, and Great Anxiety. Um, and maybe it's worth mentioning, Christian, that the Book of Mormon Academy has a whole series of books like these. There's one on the Binadi, one on the Jaredite records. There's there's a handful of them now, um, each of them taking um, a different figure, book, or um, passage in the Book of Mormon, bringing together essays from a variety of Book of Mormon scholars in the religious education department. And they're very insightful. They're, they're, they're really rich. Yeah, there's lots of really wonderful stuff in there. And I think those, I mean, that for me, sort of getting to that point, at that point, you're just having fun. And so it's about finding... The, the things that you're kind of interested, the parts of the book which you want to kind of explore more, f tracing down, you know, reading with these um, scholars, reading the book of Mormon with these scholars, and kind of following up with footnotes. And at that point, you're sort of in, you're in, you're now swimming. Um, the the armbands are off, and you're sort of swimming out alone, and you're having, you know, it's a. Um, so that I think is certainly a, a nice way to. Um, sort of stepped way to get into the water of kind of scriptural study, Book of Mormon study in our in in our case. Yeah, that's really helpful. And it, you know, we can note that in this world, it feels like all information should be free and freely available online. Even as a scholar with an incredible library, literally at my fingertips on my shelves and the BYU library just steps away. Um, I still like the, the convenience and ease of getting things online. Um, there are There is a lot that has been digitized and there are some wonderful resources out there. Um, a lot of people are familiar with the resources available at Scripture Central, at the Interpreter Foundation. I wanted to also draw attention to a really great resource that the Harold B. Lee Library hosts here at BYU and it's called Scholars Archive. It's not the easiest thing to find, and it's not the easiest thing to search, but it, you can find it, and it has PDFs of a lot of this scholarship that otherwise you may only be able to find in books, especially um, old Maxwell Institute, older Maxwell Institute scholarship. In the end, though, I'll make a case for buying books because um, you may have to buy some books. At the Maxwell Institute, we try to keep our our publications very affordable, um, but it is it is special to be able to have that object on your shelf and be able to refer to it, lend it to a friend, mark it up. Um, so don't be put off if it may mean purchasing a book or two. Um, you you won't regret having that resource with you for a long, long time. Oh, agreed. I think that's um, I think that's exactly right. I mean, we you know. There are lots of prophetic statements about uh, building a library of learning. And so <laughs> yes. I think that can be, I mean, we're in this kind of hybrid uh, world where some of these things will be easily, more easily accessible online. Some things uh, it's just nice to kind of have on your shelf. And and uh, I certainly like, um, still uh, like to be able to uh, orient myself through the books that I have on my shelf as to kind of what's been, um, what's been done. Yeah. Well, you've given us a wonderful swimming lesson as we learn how to, you know, swim out in these waters of Book of Mormon scholarship. So take us now to, take us to an island. Um, what is the first uh, piece of scholarship that you'd like to share with us and discuss today? So I was drawn, we're going to uh, first have a, a look at an, an, a chapter in the 1994 collection, The Allegory of the Olive Tree, edited by um, Ricks and Welsh. And this is a, um, you know, just a, a sort of a, a marvelously rich volume, which is engaging with scripture from a particular kind of his historical critical point of view, um, from a particular kind of historical perspective, looking at the, uh, the world of the, of the text, the world in which the text was created. And that really, um, kind of, marks the narrative and it's a, it's an era of confidence i think 
in the ancientness of the Book of Mormon and in its in the way that it belonged to and belongs to uh, uh, the world um, that it describes in the text. It belongs to that world and is kind of it comprehensible within that world. And and I was interested in. Um, uh, Jim Faulkner's piece, James Faulkner, The Olive Tree and the Work of God, Jacob 5 and Romans 11. And I wanted to see, um, one of the things that I really, um, I, I have to confess that I'm a bit of a dabbler in Book of Mormon um, studies. I'm not a proper scholar like Rosalind. You're in much better hands with her. But I do really, I'm really interested in the, uh, in the work of kind of intertextualities, which is how the Book of Mormon uh, deploys, uses, reference, alludes to scripture in the Bible, particularly. And there's some really wonderful work that's being done on this uh, topic right now. And so I wanted to get a sense of kind of where we've come from um, in and what the kind of what the world, what this kind of work looked like in 1994 with one of um, kind of uh, a reader that's hopefully known to, um, to to many people, a scholar that's hopefully known to many people, James Faulkner. Jim Faulkner is really the uh, one of the uh, kind of a leader in the field of close reading of scripture, and he did a lot of work with Romans and stuff, and did, did these wonderful collection of books um, published by uh, the Institute called you know the, the the kind of Made Harder series, which are really just about asking better questions of scripture, and he. He is a wonderful reader of scripture and a wonderful kind of questioner of scripture. And so it was fun to engage with some sort of old, you know, 30 year, um, this is kind of a mid career Jim Faulkner. He's a sort of, a, he's still a, 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 you know, a young, a young man feeling his sort of intellectual power at this point. And he does a lovely job of kind of reading, of problematizing this relationship between Jacob 5 and Romans 11. And it's interesting to see the kind of difference, and perhaps at the end we can talk about this, the difference in the way that he approaches the, the question of intertextuality and the way that the scholars today are approaching this, Latter-day Saint scholars, both from, um, a, a, both with scholars, both groups of scholars committed to the kind of ancientness of the Book of Mormon and it's, it's a, it, the fact that it's the word of God, that it's scripture, but just approaching these questions from a slightly different angle. And we can see perhaps this by um, uh, going to the, the kind of last um, footnote, um, which kind of gives you a bit of a summary of, of what happened, of, of what he's doing in this book. He says there on... Um, uh, given the evidence on both sides, so he is sort of engaging in a uh, a debate, detractors of the Book of Mormon will have difficulty explaining the points of connection between Romans and Jacob as merely Joseph Smith's creative use of Romans, just as no definite conclusion can be reached about the textual connection between Zenos and Paul either. So he is... Um, <laughs> he's kind of leaving us where he where he picked us up in some ways <laughs> uh, with this kind of problem but he has just muddied the waters or well, not i think he has actually he's asked some interesting questions and pointed out some things which we wouldn't have otherwise seen because he's a close reader he was able to to sort of do this but the but the whole context of the debate is between kind of detractors and believers and that framing i think forced him as he in his reading into um well forced him to sort of ask a set of questions which i don't personally find um like excessively interesting and stopped him from sort of going to the next step which is what contemporary scholars are doing and that is asking not simply the question of where did this parable come from? Is it dependent upon, uh, is, is Zenos dependent upon Paul? Is Paul dependent upon a common source? It, but asking what are the two texts doing that's, that's different? And he starts that project, but he doesn't sort of carry it through. He doesn't show the richness of the kind of exegetical work, this interpretive work that's happening with this kind of set of intertexts. Um, that people like Nick Frederick and, and Joe Spencer are, are, have done um, so well. So that's to um, uh, um, kind of 
start from the the kind of bigger set of questions and perhaps the framing that that is being done. There is he the basic outline of the paper is this kind of setup. We have this apparent connection between Xenos and Romans, between between um, uh, Xenos and Paul. Um, is there dependency? This is sort of the question. And and so then he takes us through this very careful reading of the differences between the two, the differences in form, the different number of trees that we have, the different setting that the, the two kind of t- um, the, the parable and, and the metaphor are being used in, the different roles of the Gentiles, the different emphasis that's given in both of these um, in both these texts. So he's he's helping us see that a a facile connection, a sort of, oh, we have an olive tree here and we have an olive tree there, well, therefore there must be some kind of um, dependency, doesn't get us that far. Right? There's something much more interesting happening here. And then once having done that, he can start talking about similarities. Mm-hmm. And the similarities are sufficient to suggest that there has to be a connection between these two texts. And so he finds himself having accepted that fact, saying, how do I make that connection? How do I uh, make that connection without having Xenos have to know what Paul wrote, sort of mm-hmm. however many uh, years before? And partly he kind of st- sidesteps that um, problem. Uh, he does it by by suggesting a kind of a third source that, that they both shared. And this is a was a sort of a common rhetorical move in that time when you were confronted with a um, a, a kind of a, a New Testament intertext, a, a clear reference to or citation from the New Testament in the Book of Mormon. The, the, the move was, well, this must be um, a, a kind of a shared source, and they're both just drawing from that source. And so the, it, it able, was able to sort of preserve um, a, a, a really a, a kind of rather simple sense of what's going on with the Book of Mormon of Scripture. Um, But it helped us, um, you know, it did that. What what Jim does next, I mean, he was a colleague of ours for a long time, so I think we'll think of him as Jim, um, is go to this kind of prophetic, the the prophetic core of the use of the, the, the parable, and that which is that they're but for the grace of God, right? There's no reason to boast... And in Jacob, a kind of reminder of the dependence of God of, that, that we both have. And so he kind of turns and makes a kind of a theological turn in, in for his conclusion. Um, and he says things like, there's a couple of kind of quotations from his conclusion. The Lord saves the trees because he desires their fruit. He labors to save the trees because doing so serves his purposes, namely the production of fruit that he reserves for himself and he commands his servants to join in that labor. And so what he's done is is pointed out that one of the differences between these, um, between the two texts, Paul is solving a problem of, of the relationship between the Gentiles and the Jews. Xenos, it, so, it seems to have a sort of a bigger um, project in mind. It's a much more extensive kind of, parable that is telling all of salvation history and the story isn't really about the trees in the end we sort of have this it's not simply about the grafting in and the grafting out the story the victory the thing that god is looking for in this whole work is this fruit and so we realize that we actually have a different and this is an element that's not included in paul at all and so what what the parable that of the olive tree gives us in the book of mormon is this sort of different set of concerns where you have a set of laborers that who are not who are also not sort of there, you who are assisting in this work of God and gathering up this fruit for um, you know for God's own sort of purposes. So we seem to have this echo of the other tree, the beautiful tree in Lehi's vision, that with this fruit that's glorious and um, and that kind of reminded me a bit of out of Bednar's talk. Um, uh, earlier this semester on the on the work of God and the works of God that the, the people who uh, are doing the work of God become themselves the work of God and so we can both enjoy the fruit of the tree and become the fruit of the tree as it were by um, this sort of work so hopefully well 
hopefully that gives us some sense mm -hmm. of what uh, um, this sort of splendid chapter is doing and some prospect of its kind of richness and why it but it deserves to be kind of reread um, at this point a kind of a you know a few decades removed from it when it was um, created yeah that I think that's so helpful and you've really I think you've put your finger on something important for our listeners to understand which is that uh, scholarship is a, a product of its time and you know as scholars of course we are we are looking to uncover things that are true um, but the, the set of questions and the particular lens that we bring to read the text is going to change over time. And so you can see Jim Faulkner in this piece kind of using a, a particular um, historical template, or sorry, a scholarly template, we might say, right? And, that, and th that template is asking questions about what came before what and what's the order of the textual history. So he's using that template and he he, you know, comes to a very tentative conclusion on it. Um, but I wonder if he might not be being a little bit more sneaky uh, than you give him credit for. Christian. <laughs> um, and, and, he, and it might be that he's just using that template um, as a way to do another, another kind of work, which, as you say, is this very close, careful reading that pays attention, not to just broad similarities, but really gets in there and looks at the details and notices things for yeah. instance as you just pointed out that um paul doesn't seem at all interested in the fruit of this olive tree whereas mm. zenus really doesn't seem interested in the tree at all he's only interested mm. in the fruit yeah so then by looking at these differences then we can start to you know think about what that might mean and and how in particular the the book of mormon next to the new testament um is uh, uh, doing a different kind of theological work, maybe mm. doing the same kind of theological work, but mm. um, it can be worth it to go back and look at this older scholarship, even though, you know, if, especially if you go back to read something by Hugh Nibley or even earlier, Sidney Sperry, or maybe mm. you really want to dig deep and you want to go back to B.H. Roberts, there's going to be an initial sense of, this feels different. Mm -hmm. um, this isn't exactly how, it, it doesn't feel current, but there's real value in doing that because often you'll find that the scholars have used the scholarly template as an occasion to do very close critical reading. And there are always, I think, insights um, and interpretations uh, that are going to be stimulating and fruitful for us now. Um, and that really is the way that scholars work is by building on the work of the past generation, in some ways bringing a new set of questions to bear, but mining the understanding of the text that the previous generation had um, you know had raked up and piled up for us to for us to use now I think that, that's exactly right Rosalind I mean that's partly why I love studying early Christian interpretation of the Bible it's because these early Christians were just close readers they were very good readers of the text and sometimes um, you, you sort of you know as things are advanced you're, like, you're sort of wild, you're making you know bad conclusions but they're always good readers and i think that you know when we find sort of other good readers in our tradition that's it's so wonderful um to um to sort of j celebrate this this uh, choir of voices that we have coming from different perspectives different concerns different interests and i yeah i'd certainly um uh, certainly value that well, there's no doubt that uh, Jim Faulkner is one of our best readers, um, we, and, and we are fortunate to, to have um, a number of really excellent close readers of the Book of Mormon already in the very short tradition of Book of Mormon scholarship, I think, um, especially since the 80s, as we've grown up reading the Book of Mormon closely um, as children, that hopefully well, it can do one of two things. It can either turn us off to the Book of Mormon and say, I, I already know it all and there's nothing more for me to find there. Or <laughs> it can train us in these practices of careful reading and, and develop a real love in us for the book. And so I think the, the harvest of um, President Benson's call, prophetic call to turn us back to the Book of Mormon uh, is being realized now. Yeah. One of, um, so, so Jim was a pioneer in this form of, 
close reading. He learned a lot from um, Jewish thinkers who likewise undertake an extremely close and meticulous systematic study of their sacred texts, the Torah. Um, so he, and he learned at the feet of some of these Jewish scholars and really introduced to Latter-day Saints um, this, this method of reading. And a, a sort of school of um, scholarship has grown up around him. Um, and the next article that I wanted to share with our listeners um, is in some ways a fruit of the, the Faulkner School and the Faulkner method of close reading. And you'll see why I say that in just a moment. Uh, this is an article by Jenny Webb, uh, a very gifted independent scholar of the Book of Mormon. That it's titled T Death, Time, and Redemption. Structural Possibilities and Thematic Potential in Jacob 726. And this was a short article that appeared in the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies in 2015. The Journal of Book of Mormon Studies is, a, is another really wonderful resource packed with all sorts of different um, types of scholarship on the Book of Mormon. And um, it, oftentimes, if you start with a book, as you said, Christian, start with a book and then read every footnote those footnotes will direct you to um, a really fruitful piece in the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies. It might be overwhelming to say, I'm mm -hmm. going to start from the beginning and read through every, you know, mm -hmm. every edition of the journal, but follow the footnotes in books and, and you'll be led to really interesting and fruitful pieces. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those. And as you could glean from the title, it's an entire article, albeit a short article, based on a single verse in Jacob, right at the very, very end. Um, in fact, it's the penultimate, the second to last verse in the book of Jacob. And I'll just read it because uh, Jenny digs so deeply into uh, this verse. So here's how it goes, Jacob 7, 26. And it came to pass that I, Jacob, began to be old, and the record of this people being kept on the other place of Nephi. Wherefore, I conclude this record declaring that I have written according to the best of my knowledge by saying that the time passed away with us and also our lives passed away, like as it were unto us a dream, we being a lonesome and a solemn people, wanderers cast out from Jerusalem, born in tribulation, in a wilderness, and hated of our brethren, which caused wars and contentions. Wherefore, we did mourn out our days. So it's such an evocative verse, just full of sadness and emotion and, and pathos. Um, but she takes, she starts out in a very analytical mode and she, and she um, analyzes the verse structurally by breaking it out into all its various clauses. Typical of, of the Book of Mormon, there are interrupting clauses, and it can be hard to parse the grammar of any sentence. Of course, the original manuscript of the Book of Mormon didn't have any punctuation in it. So um, we can feel free to think about you know, how a, a sentence is best understood in relation to itself and, and where the commas and periods and semicolons and dashes should come. So she, she analyzes it in that way, diagrams it in that way, and she kind of notices some very interesting things. I won't spend a lot of time, but she, she, she raises the possibility that Jacob kind of lost his thought, that at the beginning he was going to say something about the other place of Nephi, that is, the large place of Nephi, but then he gets kind of distracted um, and takes this dive into himself. You can see through the course of that verse as it becomes more and more personal and interior and private. Um, and, and never really does get back to those, those larger plates. Um, and so she does some very interesting sort of hardcore and um, exegetical work there. But then she makes this turn to thinking more thematically, more personally, and more theologically about the meaning of these verses. And she points out this triple repetition of these themes of death and time. Right, that, that create this overwhelming sense of melancholy. She points out, began to be old, as Jacob, you know, um, reflects on, on his own life. And then, and also our lives passed away. And then finally, at the end of that verse, we did mourn out our days. And she makes the point that through this repetition of this idea of 
time sweeping us along with it, sweeping us inevitably toward our own death, um, that it creates a sense of time in the verse itself, a sense of motion and passing. It's kind of paradoxical because it's sweeping us into the future and yet causes us to look back on our past. Um, and she very interestingly links these themes of death and solitude, expulsion, um, and pilgrimage to the primal scene of the book of Genesis, the Garden of Eden. Mm. And I think that is such an insightful turn. She has us think about Jacob as a kind of um, Adam and Eve figure who has been left, uh, expelled from the garden and is now wandering in the lone and dreary world uh, and making, making his way as a pilgrim um, toward the end of his life. It really reinforced for me um, a, something I've been thinking about uh, as I've been reading the Book of Mormon this year, and that is again and again coming back to Lehi's dream and the fruit of the tree and wondering what fruit it was they ate. You know, Jacob was one of Lehi's family members who came to the tree in the dream and who partook of the fruit. And of course, there's many ways to understand what that means. Nephi later tells us that it was the tree of life and that represents the love of God. And clearly, eating of that fruit causes, um, represents this sense of joyous union with God in Christ. But eating of the fruit also brings sadness. After Lehi eats of the fruit, he immediately wants his family to eat. And it turns out that part of his family doesn't want to come. And that becomes a deep sorrow and burden that, uh, that Lehi has to carry. And in a similar way, um, I, I feel as though Jacob now carries a burden of sadness with him after partaking of the fruit. It makes you think that that fruit is also a little bit like the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil that Adam and Eve ate, which, of course, caused them to have to leave the garden um, and pass the rest of their lives also as solemn, lonesome wanderers in the lone and dreary world cast out from the garden. So I found it to be a very, very um, provocative um, and evocative reading. I'll just make one more point, which is that she then looks at verse 27, which is the very last verse in the book of Jacob. And she sees how then Jacob makes this turn out, coming up out of himself, out of his own private sorrow and mourning. Um, and looks towards the future, looks toward the collective future um, of his people. And in the Book of Mormon, of course, the representative of that collective future and the covenant that God has made with the Lamanite remnant is always the place themselves, the record keeping themselves. And so um, in this final verse, as Jacob hands off the place to his son Enos, there is a kind of turn out of the private and into the communal. That too is um, a very powerful archetype in the Book of Mormon that, again, we saw in Lehi's dream, where he starts out just by himself, alone, wandering through the darkness, um, sees the cries out for help, sees the tree, partakes of the fruit, and immediately then turns toward his family to share what he has found with, the, um, with his, his family community. Um, so, in both those ways, I found Jenny's reading to be um, extremely insightful, very lovely, um, and very elegant exploration of just two verses in the book of Jacob. Yeah, I agree. She really um, captures that kind of uh, what can be done with a kind of a close reading of a very small amount of of, uh, of text. And I think it... it um, that this the way that the the kind of Book of Mormon is being kind of exploded out by this kind of reading, so that you can just see so much richness in it is is uh, yeah, she's really a kind of a master at it, isn't she? So, yeah, Jenny, yeah. I think that. And I just uh, read in this um, in the the collection that we referred to earlier, she has a kind of a follow up piece on um, Jacob in the context of his family, which I think is a really lovely 
because she she starts she's kind of making those gestures and she towards um, the kind of family context in this in this uh, piece. But there she kind of really does a lovely, um, a really kind of interesting um, follow up on on kind of what you know the making of this plaintive figure. And, um, and but also his kind of concerns and his desires for his family and that kind of clear love that he, uh, that he had and that's kind of evident in um, in the book of Jacob. Yeah. Well, let's dive more into Jacob and who he was and what his theological agenda was um, with another piece that you are going to share with us, Christian. Tell us about this next piece. So the other piece that I wanted to um, talk about is um, Joe Spencer's article in this um, in this new collection that's just out this year. Um, Joseph Spencer and his um, he is uh, you can't escape from him in Book of Mormon studies. Fortunately, I mean he is a uh, just a, um, a wonderfully productive and, and skilled and generous uh, scholar who is um, always inviting. Um, and interested in new ideas and new perspectives and, and tr trying to bring all the people he can into exploring this kind of wonderful book. And his long-term project, um, which has just culminated this year in the publication of, uh, of a book called A Word in Season, Isaiah's Reception in the Book of Mormon, is, has to do with how the Book of Mormon is reading Isaiah. And in this article, um, called Learning to Read Isaiah with Jacob, he sets up a really interesting sort of dynamic. And that is, um, it comes from a close reading of how Jacob seems to um, read Isaiah. And the way that he frames this, so he sets up this article by having Jacob kind of follow in Nephi's uh, footsteps, seem, he seeming to be a kind of a lesser figure, certainly um, by word count, a significantly kind of less significant figure um, than, than Nephi, and, but then sort of problematizing this. Maybe there is a, there's something going on with this relationship between Nephi and Jacob. Um, how are they relating to each other? And he uses the lens for this investigation is um, how they're each using the book of Isaiah. Now we know that Nephi loved Isaiah, gloried in Isaiah, um, sort of uh, relished in it, and gives us and quotes from it extensively. And so he, in in Spencer's sort of Joe Spencer's approach to this, he takes a very sort of systematic. He's a fantastic writer, very clear, um, a systematic approach to this question of the relationship between. Uh, Nephi and Jacob and how they're reading Isaiah. So in the first section, he looks at the continuities between Nephi and Jacob's ministries um, and how the differences really concern, as he says, strategy more than theology. And then he gives some examples of the tension in their respective use of Isaiah. And these are really uh, fascinating. The first is um, a kind of a more obvious example, although slightly sort of uh, indirect, where Jacob seems to be rejecting Isaiah's obscurity. And this is from Jacob 4.13. He seems to um, think that Isaiah is just not uh, the best thing to preach from for a uh, for this band, this, this kind of band of immigrants into this new world. Um, it's too obscure. It's And capturing a little bit of Isaiah's own commission in, in Isaiah chapter 6, um, and then he looks at something which is a, a more sort of subtle, but really kind of interesting um, uh, reason why Jacob seems to reject Isaiah and that he belongs to an entire world that seems to fuel the wrong things in this new, um, in, in this new band of, of sort of the branch broken off and, and journeying in the wilderness. It seems to promote in them things which are too redolent of that world that they've come from, of that sort of of the the kingdom of Judah, and they we find these things uh, preached against in this first, in the first um, sermon at the temple that Jacob gives, and Joe Spencer sees some of that as a as a, re a subtle rejection of of kind of Isaiah, um, but then uh, he turns to the use of Jacob's sermon in Isaiah. Um, that Nephi asked him to to teach, which is found in in the book of Nephi, 
um, itself in such yeah sorry the second book of Nephi um, six chapter six through ten where we have this kind of sermon that that uh, Nephi asked Jacob to preach on on Isaiah and then he gives us some conclusions and um, this is sort of sums it up this little story. He says, rather than simply giving license to avoid Isaiah Jacob asked the Book of Mormon readers what kind of spiritual state one must be in before earnestly working through Isaiah's meaning and importance. And uh, th so the interesting way that, he, that, that the article takes us is what sort of, what kind of a person is able to read Isaiah profitably? And he makes the argument in that, that in towards the end of the book of Jacob, after, Z, after the encounter um, that he has with Sherem in chapter 7, we have this passage where he said they turned again to searching the scriptures right at the in chapter twenty, chapter seven, verse twenty, verse twenty three, and he kind of makes this argument, which I think is really interesting, that having achieved this sort of state of peace and equanimity, they were at that point ready to start searching the scriptures, including the words of Isaiah. And Nephi himself says that you can't understand Isaiah unless you have the spirit of prophecy. Which, which interestingly, of course, um, is echoing the book of Revelation's idea that the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. And we're dealing with prophets who had seen Christ and who had, who had this kind of vision and had the spirit of prophecy and they were able to read Isaiah and draw out its sort of benefits. But for the uninitiated, um, the Zenos' parable seems to give more straightforward sort of prophetic history of the of the um the of uh the people of israel and uh so it's a really it's a fascinating piece and i have to say i could um uh, i could uh, talk about it for, for probably far <laughs> too long um because it, yeah. it it um activated all kinds of suppositions that i have about kind of the relationship between jacob and and nephi and um, but it, it has some really great sort of um, great points and conclusions and really it's a wonderfully insightful, as you'd expect, um, yeah. from Joe Spencer and a great introduction to his larger project. Yeah. The, just one point that he makes at the very end, I especially loved, um, of course, the, which is that the great theme of Isaiah and the reason why Nephi loves Isaiah and brings so quotes Isaiah so extensively is that Isaiah's great theme is the redemption of the remnant of the house of Israel. Mm. And so Nephi's great insight, of course, is that he can liken that overarching prophetic theme to the history of his own people. And he can mm. see in Isaiah's prophecies um, mm. the, the redemption of the Lamanite remnant. And so whenever, whenever, almost always, not every single time, but almost always when Nephi is citing Isaiah, it's not about what he's going through at the moment, right? It's not about the Lehite clan's migration through the desert. It's almost always about the latter-day redemption of the Lamanite remnant. Mm -hmm. So that is, of course, the, the great burden of Isaiah. So if it is the case, as Joe suggested and you just to mention to us that finally Jacob's people, um, after the encounter with Sherem, when peace and righteousness is restored, if they then are finally spiritually prepared to read and understand Isaiah, then the message they would have gotten is that the Lamanite remnant will be redeemed. And that is the moment when they undertake to bring the gospel to the Lamanites. They turn toward the Lamanites, not in enmity, and hatred, but hoping to share with them um, the messianic prophecies of, of Jesus Christ. Um, so I, I think that's such a beautiful moment there where, um, again, it's inference, um, but it's extremely suggestive that yeah. there, at the very end, there was a moment where Isaiah could finally connect um, and they could understand what he was saying, this famously obscure prophet, his message could come through, which is that God will redeem his people, he will redeem the remnant, and he will do it through the intercession of other people. Mm. Other people. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah, I think that's, and that really is a sort of a powerful um, sort of moment in the piece. Um, but I think I'm, uh, my, I came away with the sense that um, there's more to be done on this kind of relationship between Jacob and Nephi. Yeah. Um, I, I think um, in the same way that um, we 
get really great insights by reading the Book of Mormon in translation order, for example, as, as sort of Joe Spencer does with his project on Isaiah, and realize that we're dealing, we're in almost the very last moments of the translation process. There's only a few more pages, um, and we've sort of got where I think the the same could perhaps be said about Jacob and and Nephi. It seems that I, I want to kind of, uh, um, well, I, I'm inclined to imagine Jacob as this person who kind of grew up with the scriptures, saw the Lord. We don't really find out about this, had these spiritual encounters, was called to be a teacher and sort of had that role while Nephi was busy building a temple and establishing a community and doing all of these other things. And that Jacob is a, I mean, I found myself putting it in these terms. Jacob is naturally a kind of small plates kind of guy, right? <laughs> he's about the most important things and the way that his heart reaches out to those in need and the way that he sort of yearns for um, and, and empathizes with suffering and with, with the, with his lost brethren and, and wants to connect with them. Nephi is a kind of a large plates kind of guy, naturally. He is about the history and the kingship and building and temple and, and sort of, and he's also about complexity. I mean, we know that Nephi sort of geeks out every time he sees something awesome, right? That, that's like the, the ship that you built or the, the sword or the Leona. And so I think I have this vision that you have kind of Lehi and Jacob as the natural instructors and then Nephi being called like 30 years after the ministry to write his record. He's sort of called from this this large plates world into this small plates world and kind of called to make to actually and nephi is always doing things i mean the wonderful thing about you know he's he's always doing things by commandment right it's such an important theme throughout this whole um this whole section and that nephi is that sort of loyal faithful follower who is transformed through the act of obedience and i think he become and, and i want to sort of uh, suggest that Lehi and Jacob provide the kind of hermeneutical frame, but Nephi is kind of drawn to Isaiah because of its actually its exceeding fine workmanship, right? <laughs> I mean, that it is this thing yeah. which he's sort of drawn into and sees and can see so much in it, whereas Jacob is trying to just sort of reach and connect and and sort of stop this band of people from doing bad things and and hurting each other and 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 maybe you know so there's some. I think there's some, uh, this is all just to say, Joe sort of lit me on fire a bit with this the, this paper and, and started me thinking about all kinds of ways in which Jacob and Nephi kind of relate to each other and which their work might relate to each other. It's a really fun, um, yeah, I mean, it's a fun yeah. set of questions and problems, but um, yeah. Yeah, well, one thing that it really, um, raised for me it helped me to see in a whole new way why jacob would have been so conflicted about jerusalem itself and this seems to me like another important difference between jacob and nephi um jacob of course famously maybe not that famously um but in the beginning part of jacob and his sermon at the temple he calls the nephite men to task for their um sexual immorality and their adulterous practices in taking multiple wives and concubines. And um, he specifically gives this account of the origins of the Book of Mormon that we've never encountered before in the Book of Mormon. And he says, the reason why God called our father Lehi out of Jerusalem was because he wanted to raise up a righteous branch. He called them out of those wicked practices, um, specifically implying that they were the uh, sexual immorality and what joe connected for me of course is that jerusalem is the city of david and solomon mm -hmm. and so the nephites um in holding on to kind of this connection to jerusalem and especially to the davidic kingship may also have been hanging on to sexually immoral practices of, mm, of, yeah, of yeah. plural marriage and um polygyny we might say um so it, it really made me um First of all, it clarified that in my mind. And second of all, it helped me understand Jacob in a new way as kind of doubly exiled. Because not only, of course, has he never known Jerusalem, but he himself has extremely mixed at best feelings about 
Jerusalem. He can't even look back to it as a kind of Garden of Eden, mm-hmm. as a kind mm-hmm. of stable reference point that, you know, maybe maybe we'll get, we'll build a new Jerusalem in the new world. For him, he doesn't want to go back to Jerusalem. He sees it as deeply corrupt and compromised. So he mm-hmm. truly, truly is homeless and lonesome and right. solemn. And you can see where the melancholy in his character comes from as truly a rootless man. And and then you can also see why in Second Nephi 9, he turns so strongly to these questions of the next world and the mm-hmm. other life, right? Mm-hmm. And he's the first one to really draw out these teachings of, of judgment and the final fate that mm-hmm. awaits us away mm-hmm. from this world. And he talks mm-hmm. about paradise and the true church and fold of God and the kingdom of God. He's looking to the next life and the next world to find his real home. Whereas I think for Nephi um, and and maybe Sam and others, the idea of, of a new Jerusalem and, and building a society that could be um, a Zion-like society here on earth remains a life for them. But mm-hmm. I think for Jacob, it's all about what will happen after this life in the next world. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, it's really, I mean, it's uh, so... Um profound because you can for people who have been to jerusalem when you imagine yourself building something that's always going to be the model right i mean it's always going you're always going to be thinking well that you know for building a city it needs to look like that um but yeah but jacob's double exile is a really sort of powerful um uh kind of insight into that uh, uh yeah that sort of yearning and uh, that we find in in uh, seven twenty six. That's yeah. yeah, that's lovely. Well, let's talk about one final piece here, um, and th- this is Deidre Nicole Green's um, brief theological introduction to the Book of Jacob, which was published by the Maxwell Institute as part of the series in twenty twenty. We've been talking about who Jacob is um, and and how he differs while sharing, of course, the same um, prophetic zeal as his brother Nephi and his father Lehi. And Deidre gives us um, a very distinct portrait of who Jacob is. Um, She sees him as a vulnerable and empathic religious leader, um, the product of the traumas and upheaval of his childhood, and as a result of that, concerned largely with issues of social justice among the Nephites. Um, for him, the way you love your neighbor is inseparable from the teachings of the coming of Jesus Christ. For him, you cannot separate the social from the spiritual. They were one and the same. And he spent his life trying to wake up the Nephites to um, the injustices whether class-based or sex-based injustices that they were recreating here in this new world. And it, it, it almost broke his heart. It almost broke him. You get the feeling. Um, and yet, Deidre gives us a portrait of a man who, with incredible persistence and especially incredible love, stays in relation with this people, even though their choices are breaking his heart, and does everything that he can to teach them. Um, she has this wonderful line that in the book of Jacob, the Book of Mormon takes a sharp turn from the narrative, that is, stories either about the migration or the future, right? The, the future redemption of the Lehi clan. So it takes a sharp turn from the narrative to the normative, from descriptions of one family's sojourn and divine promises to be fulfilled in the future to prescription for human behavior to be enacted in the here and now. And so she um, reads everything that Jacob writes in the in the seven chapters of the book of Jacob, and then also the sermon that is excerpted um, in 2 Nephi 6 through 10 through that lens. Um, she sees him trying to heal this fractured society, fractured within the Nephites, and of course fractured between the Nephites and the Lamanites. His focus on reconciliation and right relationship um, on the systemic consequences of sin. Sin never remains private, but it ripples out to harm um, and um, and break the people around us. Um, she sees Jacob as a deeply humble figure who again and again is willing to set aside his own position of authority and relate as a human being 
to another human being, very aware of his own weakness and kind of the fundamental human equality that we share. We, we are all equal because we are all broken and because we are all creatures of God. None of us stands on our own two feet. So with this lens, I thought she had a really striking reading of the episode in Jacob 7 um, with the first of these Antichrist figures that we'll encounter, three of them, through the Book of Mormon. But here is the first Sherem. And I think that her insight is based on a formal feature of the text, which is that at the, at the heart of this story of the encounter between between Jacob and Sherem is a dialogue. And it really is a dialogue as we see Jacob and Sherem talking to each other and responding to each other. So she notes this formal feature, the dialogue here. And um, she, from that, she draws these kind of normative or theological um, conclusions. And here's, what, here's her, her overarching idea about this episode. Jacob's underlying belief that Sherem is worth contending with he is a soul worth saving, leads him to willingly remain in dialogue with him. Jacob could have, first of all, just never made himself available to Sherem. We were told that Sherem has to work pretty hard to find Jacob and to, to initiate this conversation. Jacob could have continued to avoid him, or he could have immediately shut him down by drawing on his own priestly authority. Um, or he could have simply dismissed Sherem as an incorrigible uh, doubter um, and apostate. But Jacob does not do any of those things. He stays with this conversation. And Deidre points out a couple of really key moments. Um, at the beginning of the conversation, Jacob um, makes a point to say, I am emptying myself of what I might want to do or say to you, Sherem. <laughs> I and I am going to let the Spirit fill me. I am going to say only the words that the Spirit gives to me. I am not going to argue with you from my position of power and say, I'm a priest, you're wrong, get out of here. Um, but he empties himself of that authority and said, relates to Sharon one on one, allowing the Spirit to fill, um, to, to fill his mouth and his heart. And what she notes is that Jacob's willingness to do that ultimately is a model for Sherem. And Sherem responds in kind. And at the end of the story, he himself admits that he had been deceived. And in great humility, um, he anticipates that he will experience the consequences of his deception. So Jacob's kind of self-emptying facilitates Sherem's self-emptying. And then as we've discussed just a moment ago, ultimately, Sherem's humble witness facilitates the Nephites' own humble repentance. In witnessing Sherem's repentance and self-emptying, it seems as though the Nephites are then um, spiritually renewed um, and able to see the Lamanites, whom, you know, as Jacob tells us in great detail, the Nephites had considered themselves superior to the Lamanites in every way up until this point. And it seems as though they're spiritually changed by what they witnessed in Jacob and Sherem, and then they are willing to now turn towards the Lamanites, um, hoping to help them and save them. Another important point she makes, though, is that real love, another thing that Jacob might have done is just try to avoid conflict and say, okay, Sherem, yeah, yeah, maybe you make some good points. Yeah, we could, we could probably think about that and, you know, just try to keep the peace, but um, allow Sherem to continue living in his false self concept to, to continue to, to dwell in deception. But Deidre makes the point that real Christ-like love doesn't allow the beloved to dwell in deception. So even though it was more time-consuming um, and, and probably very uncomfortable for Jacob, um, he stayed with the conversation and continued to um, show Sherem that he was mistaken. He was deceived. Um, and the result is this kind of beautiful interwoven testimony where Sherem himself can join with Jacob to testify of Christ at the, at the very end of his life. Um, Jacob has this characteristic way of lifting up the person who his audience would expect to be the, the bad example and using that person or that group 
as the good example. So we saw this in the sermon at the temple where he holds up the Lamanites and says, the Lamanites, despite not having the prophecies of Christ, they are more righteous than you because they treat their wives with respect and there is love within their families, whereas you, Nephite men, um, are abusive and, and prideful. Um, and so the, so the Lamanites then become the witness of, of um, Christ-like social ethics. And in that same way here, she argues, Jacob allows Sherem, kind of the final word, this antichrist. But because he was willing to stay with him, Sherem comes to the point where he himself can testify of Christ. He becomes a kind of mouthpiece or revelation of Christ. And of course, this is such a, a deeply, um, this, this is a theme that is so deeply interwoven into the gospel of Christ because Jesus Christ himself was the suffering servant, the man with no apparent beauty who was cast out and rejected by his people um, and yet came as the son of God to redeem his people from their sins. So I, I, found, um, I, I found Deidre's rereading very counterintuitive rereading, right? It, on a first read through Jacob 7, you might think, oh, this is just kind of very black and white, the believers, the wish fulfillment of a believer owning the non-believer. But through this careful and patient reading, I think she shows us that something very different is going on and something very, very beautiful that not only testifies of Christ in word, but also in action. Yeah, oh, that's pretty beautiful, Rosalind. That um, I, 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 I'm somebody who is sort of uh, t dangerously risk averse and sort of conflict averse, and um, in in a way which, but it, it's lovely to kind of be challenged by this to see in Jacob perhaps somebody who similarly didn't really want this kind of an encounter, but whose kind of spiritual sensitivities had taught him to, to realize that he had to have it. He needed to do this kind of work. It's really su such a, yeah, it sort of challenges me on a, on a deep sort of personal level to perhaps be more, um, you know, to uh, to remember that sort of peace. Um, it can't be necessarily sort of obtained at any any price if you want it to be lasting and sort of meaningful and, and to really transform a community. So that, that's uh, yeah, it's so beautiful. It asks us to take the path of greater resistance rather than the path of least resistance um, in those mm -hmm. moments, and mm -hmm. um, it encourages me to have the courage to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, Christian, we're coming towards the end of our interview here, but um, each of us are wanted to share a passage from the Book of Jacob that has been important and meaningful to us personally. So I wanted to give you the opportunity now to share with us something that um, that you love. Um, this was uh, my, my sort of normal go-to passage is, is Jacob seven twenty six because I am uh, I feel like an exile from my home country and sort of but can no longer go back to the same place that I left yeah. right I mean I could go but it's it's so but this time reading through I really found uh, some something kind of quite lovely in in um, in Jacob's telling of the of Zenos's parable and we're at the kind of last the winding up scene um in Jacob ch uh, chapter 5 verse 49 through 51 and it reads it came to pass that the lord of the vineyard said unto the servant let us go to and hew down the trees of the vineyard and cast them into the fire that they shall not cumber the ground of my vineyard for i have done all what more could I have done for my vineyard? So we, we're in this moment of um, kind of despair, but we quickly realize that this is, uh, it's an opening for the servant to sort of step in and do precisely what the Lord has taught um, the servant to do. And the servant says, but behold, the servant said unto the Lord of the vineyard, spare it a little longer. And the Lord said, Yea, I will spare it a little longer, for it grieveth me that I should lose the trees of my vineyard. And so the Lord is always teaching us whenever we're kind of, you know, acting in our life and being presented with a kind of a moment of 
or despair or looking out at the world and not feeling any hope is not an opportunity for us to withdraw but actually an opportunity for us to sort of advocate and it reminds me of abraham pleading for the people of sodom and gomorrah or in james 5 16 we're taught to pray for one another that you may be healed the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous soul availeth much so i think we're being called into this relationship with the world in this parable the spare it a little longer find there must be some more we can do there must be something we can do and then the the lord and the servant sort of go to to get to to achieve that to do all the work necessary to try and perhaps get some additional fruit and save some of the branches i find this a wonderful and hopeful um sentiment when in in the time where i increasingly feel that the only thing to do is really sort of withdraw to, to step back and say that there is, you know, you couldn't have done anything more, just, you know, burn it all to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> that call to persistence and to staying in relationship, um, even when it's hard. As I was reading Jacob by this time, I had this thought that, of course, we, we think of, of the Savior as the Lord of the vineyard, right? Um, and, and it's his love, and, and, and he is the ultimate source of divine love. But I had this thought, what if we read Lehi as the, um, as the Lord of the vineyard figure? Um, and that was meaningful to me, to think of Lehi choosing to stay in relation with Laman and Lemuel, even though from the very beginning, right, he's seen that they hesitate to come to the tree. Um, yet he, it seems as though he never stops. And in Second Nephi, we read the beautiful blessings that he leaves on them and on their posterity. Um, and I kind of see him um, as a Lord of the vineyard, grieved and sad, um, but unwilling to ever, ever give up, um, tireless in his attempts to, to reach out and to save what he can. So that kind of brought that brought that passage to life in a new way for me this time. I wanted to um, share a, a, a verse that spoke to me with a new voice as well, this time through as I read through. And this is a very well-known uh, verse in Jacob chapter 4, at the beginning of Jacob chapter 4, 13. And this is kind of um, this, this um, place where Jacob is reflecting on the purpose of prophecy, um, why they keep these plates, um, and it's in order to make it perfectly clear that they knew of Christ many hundreds of years before their coming, right? It's to testify to, um, to his people um, that, that they knew of Christ and that they were enlivened by Christ. Um, and so that, that's the whole reason why they do this. Um, so with that context of Christ and the messianic prophecies of his coming and the salvation that is available in Christ, um, I, I read this verse with new eyes. So here it is, Jacob 4.13. Behold, my brethren, he that prophesieth, let him prophesy to the understanding of men. For the Spirit speaketh the truth and lieth not. Wherefore, it speaketh of things as they really are and of things as they really will be. Wherefore, these things are manifested unto us plainly for the salvation of our souls. So in the past when I've read this, I've, I, I don't really know how I've interpreted it. I've probably kind of skipped over it. But yeah, the Spirit speaks the truth and, and he tells us, about everything as it really is and everything as it really will be. But Jacob is speaking particularly here about salvation in Christ. So with that context, the Spirit speaks to us of salvation in Christ as it really is and as it really will be. So that made me think about salvation as something that happens now, something that can be present for us now, something that really is now and something that really will be. There's an experience of, um, of new birth, of the mighty change of heart that King Benjamin's people will experience um, that is available to us now. 
the sweetness of that fruit um, can be ours in this life. There's also, of course, the scene of judgment and ultimate reunion and eternal union with God that will be real for us in the future. But let's not forget the thing as it really is now, which is um, knowing Christ in this moment and during this life, asking, seeking, and knocking um, for that knowledge of Christ now. So I, that opened up this verse to me in a new way um, and made me hungrier to know Christ now um, rather than just putting it off, being obedient now so that I can know him later. What do you think, Christian? Is that a, is that a good reading of that verse? Yeah, I really like that. I, I, um, I think that uh, um, it kind of ex it, it opens up what, what is on the face of it a kind of an unpromising verse. As you say, it's sort of a matter of fact, this is how things work kind of verse. But placing Christ back into the center of it, that's just such a lovely, it kind of suddenly, it's illuminating, right? illuminated and illuminating. I think it, um, and I think any time that we can sort of see that the point of it all is for Christ to be more present in our world and in us, I think then the scriptures have done their job. And that, I think, is our hope for our listeners, is that everything that we have talked about will give you a new perspective, maybe a phrase here and there, maybe a new idea um, that will give you new eyes to read the Book of Mormon. You may have read it many times. Maybe this is your first time reading it, um, but we hope that it will bring those words to life and illuminate them in a new way so that the Spirit really can carry them to your heart uh, and, and allow you to feast feast on them the way that, that Nephi so loves to do. Christian Hill, thank you so much for joining us today on the Book of Mormon Studies podcast. Thanks. It's been great to be here. It's been wonderful. Bye-bye.